Dog Works Radio is sponsored by Alaska Dog Works. Check out their website at alaskadogworks.com. From First Paw Media, sponsored by First Paw Coffee Company, this is the Dog Driver Show. Visit our website at dogworksradio.com. Now here are your hosts, Robert Forto and Kurosh Parto. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Robert and I am here with my co-host KP and we are the Dog Driver Show. And today we have a guest returning who was just with us last week. His name is Arlie Reynolds. He's calling in from Fairbanks. And on his last episode, we talked all about what it was like to be a world-class dog driver for ONAC and for Rondi and all the big races. But today we're going to jump into the scientific side of his career. And this is something I'm really excited about. I could really geek out on this and uh, probably listen and talk to him forever. But uh, before we do that, KP, introduce Arlie again, please. Um, Arlie Reynolds, uh, rendezvous, ONAC champion, but also a uh, researcher, PhD, uh, Cornell University. A lot of background with uh, uh, research that he has, icon in our sport. Uh, and uh, last week we chatted with him about his uh, race uh, racing career. And uh, this week we're going to talk to him about his uh, professional and uh, scientific career that we have. Arlie, thank you so much for uh, being with us again. And uh, for our listeners, give us a little bit of background about who you are and uh, how you started uh, as a researcher and a vet. Sure. Thanks, thanks for having me on, guys. Um, so I'd always wanted to be a veterinarian since I was a little kid, and I was lucky enough to go to vet school at Cornell and graduate from there in uh, 1986. I uh, went out into private practice and enjoyed that, but decided I wanted to learn more. Came back and did a PhD looking at the relationship between diet and performance in sled dogs. Um, graduated from there in 92, and then got board certified in clinical nutrition in 95. And all the while I was working with dogs and sort of developing this uh, model of, of uh, performance athlete and, and how to best feed these dogs and understand their metabolism, which is truly amazing. And make, using that as a model of, of stress um, so that we could use nutritional interventions to study how best to help all dogs manage stress. Um, and uh, you know, as I went on, I was spending more and more time in Alaska and decided I wanted to move up there and was fortunate to get a job with Nestle Purina, where we did research looking at those things, um, which also supported my racing. So I always felt like it was really important to apply what I learned in the laboratory out in the field because we, we were not just supporting dog mushers, but everybody who works with dogs. We work with military guys, with search and rescue guys, with police guys, with um, guys and gals that, that do hunting um, at all, across every arena, you know, from uh, hounds to pointing dogs to retrievers um, and also dogs like uh, border collies herding dogs and stuff like that. So we try to try to understand the whole gamut, looking at sled dogs as sort of the ex- extreme example, feeling like if we can feed those dogs well, we can feed any dog well. And uh, speaking of uh, diet and nutrition for sled dogs, what would be a good uh, dog food for a sled dog? I know that today uh, a lot of people are doing raw feeding, a lot of people that are doing kibble and raw, and uh, a mixture of all of those. In your opinion, scientifically, what is a good dog food for an athlete? Man, that's a great question. And again, you know, as I said in the earlier session, I think there's kind of a Zen approach to dog mushing where there are many approaches that will help you reach the goal. Um, one of the things we want to do first before we pick a good dog food is understand why and how it is we should be feeding, you know, what it is these dogs' requirements are, so why it is we're feeding the type of food we are. There should be a reason for that, not just randomly pick one. And then how best to feed them, you know, what's the best strategy for different times of the year, for different, um, you know, times of the racing season, uh, racing and recovery versus training. So, you know, those types of things all factor into what is the best dog food and how to feed it. But when we get down to the nuts and bolts of that, what we want to do is feed a high-protein, high-fat diet, and by that, what I mean is a diet that's at least, you know, at least 25, 30 percent of the calories coming from protein, um, and that is at least 20 percent of the calories coming from fat. And as we increase the intensity and the duration of exercise, we're going to need more fat and probably more protein too. And so, um, you know, there, there are very few commercial diets that really fit the needs of um, a, a high-performing sled dog. 
And that's why people do supplement with things like meat and fat and stuff like that. And I think, you know, if you want to look at a range, I think the optimal range for performing dogs would probably put the percent of calories in the 50 to 60 percent for fat and then the 30 to 40 percent for protein, which doesn't leave a lot for carbs. And they don't need a lot of carbohydrates. And when we get into that upper echelon, like if we're looking at a Diderot dog or a dog that's running the Cusco or the Copper Basin or the Bear Grease, um, those dogs are burning for like an average, say, 55 to 60 pound dog, they're burning 11,000 calories a day, which is eight times as much as a Tour de France cyclist on a per pound of body weight per day basis. So the reason I bring that up is there's no room for for extra stuff in there. You've got to be pretty precise in the way you feed those guys because that's pretty much at the limit of what their GI tract can handle. That is uh, interesting. You talked about supplements, uh, uh, Arlie, uh, and uh, what type of, if you're doing that type of diet, what type of supplement uh, usually you believe that these uh, athletes they would need? Yeah, I can I can tell you I can tell you how we fed, okay, and you know working with other folks, it's it's fairly similar. I would I would find a very good commercial diet as your basis because that's going to bring in your vitamins and minerals and it's going to be real digestible and it's going to form the basis of your diet. You're going to feed that year round, and then depending on intensity and duration of exercise and environmental conditions, you know, like cold weather, then you may add extra fat um, in the form of poultry fat. Um, beef tallow or pork fat. You can also use fish oil, but you've got to be real careful with fish oil because if it's not well-preserved, it can actually make the dogs very sick. So I use small amounts of that. Um, but that's a good source, of course, of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and then the protein. And, and because you're feeding that much fat, what we've found in the past is if you don't up protein when you're upping fat, the dogs can get protein deficient and it can make them anemic and um, decrease their performance. So Usually folks will supplement with a protein supplement like egg powder or chicken or beef or, you know, some other muscle meat. And I always like to try to use a different type of meat than I did at dry food so that I was kind of mixing my protein sources. So the dry food I used was Purina Pro Plan Performance. We fed that for over 20 years and had great success with it. There are other good performance diets on the market, um, some really good ones. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm not just... I'm just telling you what I did. And, you know, Buddy uses a different brand. Eagle uses a different brand. There are other very good brands out there. Um, and then uh, I, I would add on to that up anywhere between a pound and a pound and a half of ground beef. That was about 25% fat. And then I had a fat mixture that was partly chicken fat, partly corn oil, and a little bit of fish oil that we had mixed up and froze. And I would, I would titrate that to the dog's needs. If we were running far, if it was cold, they'd get more fat. If we were... You know, if we were just early in the training season, they get less. Then I, the, in terms of supplements, I think this is really important, and I, I don't just give supplements willy-nilly. I have reasons for doing it, and those reasons are based on things that we've actually tested in the laboratory. And over, you know, 30 years of this type of work, I've found five that I think are essential. Um, one of them is um, psyllium. Psyllium is, I think, one of the best things you can do to protect your dog, dog's health. It does a lot of different things. It, it, it's fermented in the gut, so it drops the pH of the gut and favors the growth of good bacteria. It feeds the good bacteria, so it's like a prebiotic. But it also generates, through that fermentation, what we call volatile fatty acids, which is the main food source or energy source for the cells that line the gut. So you're actually making the gut healthier, too. And it, it also has physical properties, so if the dog's stools get a little loose, it, it firms them up. If they're too firm, it'll loosen them up. That's... To me, it's, it's essential, and we start adding that once we hit about eight miles of training a day, we will add psyllium. Um, of course, the, the meat and, and bone meal, because you're, if you're adding meat and lot there's bones in it, you're going to have to add some bone meal to, or other calcium source so the bones don't get thin. You wanna, so those, you know, that, that's a real important one. Um, astaxanthin is another one. We started looking at astaxanthin back in 2001. Astaxanthin is an antioxidant that's found in um, blue-green algae, it's also found in things that eat that, like krill and salmon oil. It's 50 times more effective than vitamin E. It, it is tremendous at quenching for the free radicals that are generated during oxygen metabolism. And when our dogs start exercising, they increase their oxygen metabolism 10 to 20-fold. So they increase the generation of these free radicals. One thing that's super important about when you, when you give antioxidants is I don't give it year-round. I let the dogs go through the majority of training by just amount of antioxidants that are in their food 
And then when we get to the racing season, I add it in. And the reason for that is if you add it in ahead of time, you actually stop the body from making its own what we call endogenous or inside the body antioxidant systems. There are several enzyme systems that the body will generate that are super great in terms of their capacity to quench these free radicals. But if you give antioxidants in training, you stop that. You also dampen the response to training because some of the response, like building muscle, building red blood cell mass, all that stuff that you get from training is due to the generation and damage done by these free radicals. You don't want a lot of damage, but you need a little to get the signaling to get the adaptation to training. And there's been several studies in people and rats that show that if you give too much antioxidants, you get less of a response to your training. So we save it for right like a month before the racing season when the dogs are all trained up and then and then use it through the racing season. Um, another, another one of those supplements is egg powder, hyperimmunized egg powder, something we've been working with for probably uh, 16, 17 years. And that's uh, a product where they, they actually vaccinate chickens against the major pathogens um, that the dog might face. And then the chicken lays an egg and it's full of antibodies against those pathogens. Now, the dog doesn't absorb those antibodies into its bloodstream, but they are in the gut and they actually activate the immune cells in the gut and help protect the dog against things like kennel cough, diarrheas, you know, coronavirus, rotavirus, um, salmonella, E. coli, campylobacter, all those things. But it's not an antibiotic, so it's not a drug. It just upregulates the body's own immune system. And remember, 80% of the cells, the immune cells in the body, are in the gut. So if we can influence those guys, we influence whole body immunity. And we've actually seen this where you, if you give this stuff, like during the time you're vaccinating the dogs versus dogs that are not given it but fed the same way, they both get a nice response to the vaccine. But two to three months later, the vaccinated dogs, because you're in training, actually drop below pre-vaccination levels and they're titers against things like parvo and distemper and rabies, whereas the dogs that are giving the egg powder keep that titer all the way through the racing season. So it's a way of just beefing up the immune system, not over beefing it so they get sick, but beefing it up so that they are protected against, um, you know, how many times you've gone to a race and your dogs are looking great and then they either get kennel cough or they get a diarrhea and it really, you know, knocks you back. Those are, the, well, those are those are the main supplements, and then of course the post-exercise carbohydrate replacement that everybody uses. Arlie, those are what they uh, when uh, people uh, we would talk about my dogs. They have a bug or uh, the GI uh, issues. Those are the issues we are talking about. Is that right? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask something very interesting. Uh, uh, myself, among a lot of other drivers, uh, when we have issues, uh, uh, we call. Uh, Arlie, and we ask him for advice. How difficult it is as a racer, a person with a racing hat, uh, to give advice to your competition uh, how to get their dogs better and healthier and more competitive to race against you? I uh, appreciate you asking that question. Because I can tell you there are many times when I like would show up at the North American and Nagel would come to me and say, man, my dogs have terrible diarrhea. I'm not sure we're going to get through this race. And we'd be working on a a probiotic that was really great for fighting um, for fighting uh, the diarrhea and, and especially great at getting the dogs back. You know, after they have diarrhea, they're often their gut isn't quite right for a while. They have what we call a dysbiosis because of the whatever the infection was, whether it was viral or bacterial, has disrupted their normal gut microflora, their microbiome, and it takes a while for that to reach a new equilibrium. And, and I would give him what we had, um, the, the, what we were working on, and my philosophy on that was this. If, if, I, if I'm going to win the rendezvous with the North American, I want to win because I'm the best team there. I don't want to win because somebody else had a problem or especially if I could do something about it. I mean, as a veterinarian and as a researcher, I think it's my, my duty to take the things that we learn and make it available for everybody. And I'd rather level the playing field like that and let the best team win than win because somebody else had a problem. And if I, if, if I had won a race like that and I knew I could have helped the Eagle, it would be a pretty shallow victory. So, and he actually, anecdotally, he did beat me. I came in second in that race. <laughs> no, it's uh, so true. Uh, Arlie's always, always open to uh, to give advice. Myself, I recall, uh, oh gosh, it was like 10, 15 years ago at the World Championship uh, we were having lunch, and I picked his brain, and I had issues with my uh, some of my uh, diet, and he gave me plenty of advice uh, to fix the problems. That was interesting. Um, Arlie, I'm going to switch here completely from uh, diet and nutrition uh, to uh, 
uh, sled dogs in general and uh, some of the lameness and injuries. And what are the main injuries uh, uh, that you sometimes see uh, uh, during the races that we have? Oh, that's a great question. And, of course, a lot of it is going to depend on um, several different factors, one, of course, being the conditions. There are certain conditions that predispose you to different types of injuries. And then, of course, how well everybody's trained up and, and things like that. Um, if there have been years where the people haven't been able to get good training, we'll get different types of injuries. But, um, you know, the most common injuries we see and probably the least serious are foot injuries like, you know, um, uh, fissures in their feet, you know, web cracks which are treatable, but they're a pain in the neck. Um, you know, nail bed injuries or losing a toenail. Um, those are also a bit painful initially, but treatable. Um, wrist injuries are super common in dogs, and that usually comes from hyperextending their wrist, oftentimes by stepping in a moose hole or in soft snow. Um, those can take a little longer, depending on how severe they are. Sometimes with a leg wrap and just a short rest, you can get them back. And I think that's easier for a long distance musher than a sprint musher because, you know, we're much more on the edge. We can't if we have a dog that's just a little bit slower than everybody else, either we have to slow the whole team down or um, we have to pick, we'll end up picking that dog up as it tries to keep up with the others. So for us, I think it's a little harder to get a dog with that type of an injury back in during the race, but often between races we can get them back. Shoulder injuries, which we call shoulder injuries, are really more injuries of soft tissue around the shoulder, um, usually from um, either the infraspinatus, supraspinatus, or biceps muscles. Those um, take a little longer to heal. My experience is a minimum of two weeks and sometimes longer, and they require some a little bit of physical therapy. Um, and those, again, can come from, a lot of times we see those from dogs that are either um, not used to going as fast. So in other words, we have a year where there's not great snow, everybody's on a four-wheeler, then we take them to a race and the dogs can just fly. And um, the dogs weren't quite ready to do that. Um, or running fast down hills, and, or again, stepping in soft snow or holes. And then the other common injury that I see a lot are uh, lumbar injuries, so the, between the last rib and the tail, part of the back. And those come from the sliding on ice, which shoulder injuries can also come from, or um, pulling really heavy loads or abrupt stopping, things like that. And we can, tend to see those types of injuries more commonly towards the back of the team and particularly in wheel dogs, and that's why it's a really good idea to rotate your wheel dogs if you can do it um, because that's an area with that – dogs can get chronic use injury from just because of the load that they're dealing with and, and the way they get yanked around corners and stuff. Now, we're getting better in terms of harnesses and lines and sleds, so that, that is less of an issue as it used to be when we just had the wooden sleds and, and we're sliding around a lot of corners, but it can still be an issue on a hard, fast trail. It's uh, interesting. Uh, you actually uh, said in my next question, I was thinking about asking you harnesses and lines and equipment. Uh, currently, we have a gigantic trend of uh, different people talking about new equipment, you know, bike drawing harnesses, uh, X back harnesses, uh, open back harnesses. Uh, as a researcher and uh, someone who is very familiar with the physiology of an animal, uh, do you think the right equipment or a uh, right harness makes a big difference on the type of uh, effort that they are putting? I, I definitely do, and I think it also can make a big difference in terms of preventing injuries. But it's you know saying what is the right harness is a hard thing to do because it's going to depend a lot on what you're doing and, and individual dogs. And I've, I've even used different harnesses within my team because some of them fit the dogs better an individual dog better than, than what everybody else was using. If you look at pictures of my winning team in 2013 and 2014, you'll see that there are at least two different types of harnesses that I have. And it's not because I'm you know trying to get sponsorship from two different companies or something. It's because for those individual dogs, those harnesses fit them better. And I think that's the key. I think getting a good fit and knowing how to fit a harness is really important. We get lots of injuries that are associated with poorly fitting harnesses, ones that are too lo loose, where the breastplate slips up underneath uh, the front leg, or um, you know, if they're too tight, the dog can't quite move right. Um, they need to have be able to open, you know, to open up their back, and it, if it, if it's too tight there, um, and that it's not just the harness; that's also the way the lines are put together. So there, you know, there's a lot of little nuances in there that add up to either a really nice smooth run or a, a increasing the risk for injury. 
That is so true. I uh, I really appreciate everything uh, he's uh, talking about. Getting back on uh, supplements, uh, Arlie, you talked about antioxidants. Picked my uh, uh, you know uh, my attention right away. How important is that uh, antioxidant in general for sled dog and astaxanthin? I personally use it, and uh, I know a lot of our top teams they've been using that product for a while. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I think it's really important. I mean, what you're trying to do is give your dogs all the things that they need to be as successful as they are capable of being within their own capacity, right? So, um, as I mentioned earlier, what I try to do is not supplement with antioxidants during the training season so the dogs will develop their own, within their body, what we call endogenous antioxidants, which are a series of enzymes like superoxide, dismutase, catalase, glutathione peroxidase. And that's a, that's, a, that's a huge amount of antioxidant capacity that gets developed there. And then what happens when you, um, when you get closer to a race, like a month before the real heavy racing starts, I'll start with astaxanthin. I'll usually supplement around 4 to 6 milligrams. I've gone as high as 8, but I don't think there's a lot of benefit going any higher than 4 to 6. And I think 4 is actually the kind of the sweet spot. I've gone as low as 2, and that seems to work well. I think 4 is probably a bit better. So I usually use four milligrams per dog per day. And I can tell you from studies that we've done, it's one of the few things where not only could we measure differences in their blood in terms of decreased indices of damage to their muscle, but we could also see a difference in how fast the dogs recovered, how well they drank and ate, how less stiff they were after hard runs. And so, you know, when you're going into a race like the Rendezvous or the North American or the Stage Stop in Wyoming or even Iditarod, where the dogs are going to run multiple days in a row and they're not going to have time to, to, to you know, you want to optimize every minute of recovery that they get, uh, I think the antioxidants are crucial. I really do. But again, I think it's very important to, to pay attention to the, the timing of when you feed them. And you don't want to do that during training or you'll actually decrease their effect. Arlie, uh, again, at the top of the show, I said that I could really just geek out about this and, and talk forever. And my question is, is one I'd asked you before about advice, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, your academic journey and a little bit of my personal story before we jump into that. Uh, I went back to school for a second bachelor's degree in 2014 for outdoor leadership and went on to go with, into a master's degree in sports management and now into a doctorate degree in strategic leadership. And every paper that I wrote had something to do with mushing, whether it be from, you know, an expedition planning perspective or, you know, team building or whatever. And I know you don't know this, but your work sort of was an inspiration for that because I remember reading your articles in Mushing Magazine in the early 2000s and all of that work and I thought, wow, nobody is doing research with sled dogs, whether it be on the team side, on the people side, or on the dog side, with the exception of you from my understanding. So you sort of had a part in my academic journey, which I think is pretty cool now that we're talking today. And my question to you is for those that are wanting to pursue an academic degree, whether it be at the bachelor's level or even all the way up through PhD or, or whatever, what would you tell them to follow that, uh, that journey, to, to have that end goal in mind of, of working with sled dogs or, or whatever? What advice could you give them? I, I, that's a great question. Um, I think the best advice I would give them is to um, – to learn as much as you can from the people who are um, doing what you want to do or um, doing what you aspire to do. Um, you know, we have so many people out there that don't have degrees, really, but have degrees in life that have learned. I mean, for me, dog mushing is kind of a metaphor for life. You know, Roxy Wright has been my main mentor, and all the time she was mentoring me in dog mushing, she was also really mentoring me in life. Right. And there's so much that you can learn from dog mushing, the way that we relate to dogs. And I think a great example of that is if you look at programs like George Atlas' program that he named after his son, the Frank Atlas Youth and Sled Dog Care Program, or the A. Chill program that's just going on right now out of the Gateway School District. These are programs that use um, working with dogs as a way of developing cultural identity, of transferring traditional knowledge, of developing resilience against things like substance abuse and, and suicide prevention, or resilience against suicide, I should say, and, and, and also um, uh, promoting 
graduating from high school and, and going on to careers. And they've been incredibly successful. And I think that bond between people and dogs is something that's very primal to, to all of us. You know, in urban settings, some people have gotten away with it, away from it, I should say. But I think they're starting to get back to it. I think this current epidemic is a great example of why we need to get back to more, more basic roots. But there's something about us that I think is hardwired to be with dogs, to, to live with them and to work with them. And I think when you actually work together, that develops that relationship to a degree that you never see if it just stays as a sort of a pet relationship. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And as I mentioned earlier, I, I pretty much focused all of my academic writing on that particular topic. I was going to do it whether the, uh, you know, whether the assignment said so or not. I sort of tailored that, that, uh, that, that course of study. Is your advice as well for somebody that's in you know, higher, higher education to, to write about what they're passionate about, not just churning out papers and churning out research, et cetera? Absolutely. I mean, there are going to be times when you have to do a certain course for your degree, right? And it may not be what you're passionate about, but the end goal is something you're really passionate about. And when you do that, I mean, I've been really fortunate to do it for over 30 years, and um, you'll never work a day in your life. And right. also, the, the neat thing about that is when you're really passionate about it like that, there'll be unexpected things that come out of it that, are, that may be more important than what your original goal was. And I would use George's program with the kids like that. I mean, as a veterinarian... I never thought I would be working in suicide prevention um, with indigenous people, and, and that's one of the most rewarding things that I've ever been fortunate enough to be part of. So uh, I think that it's, you know, keep your options open, keep your eyes open and, and your ears open and your mouth shut, <laughs> and just uh, learn as much as you can. Great advice for sure. KP, close us out with Arlie, please. Uh, Arlie, I uh, wanted to thank you uh, for sharing uh, your knowledge, your expertise, your passion with us, uh, and uh, looking forward to see you in Fairbanks again, and maybe we can go fish or do something together. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, that'd be so much fun. You let me know. I'd, I'm always up for fishing. and <laughs> want to wish you the best of luck next year. I think you have a beautiful team, and I really look forward to seeing you on, on the streets in Anchorage and thank hopefully you, up here in Fairbanks too. Excellent. Thank you, Arlie Reynolds, as our guest today. And on behalf of my co-host, KP, this is Robert for the Dog Driver Show. Be sure to check us out over on dogworksradio.com. And uh, we have episodes going back over a year now. So we've done a lot of interviews from mushers all over the world. We will see you guys next time. Goodbye. From First Paw Media, this is the Dog Driver Show. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and we invite you to subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find a link on the episode notes. You can tap or swipe on the episode cover art and you can see some offers from our sponsors. You can support our show by supporting them. If you like what you have heard, we would love it if you could give us a five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe too. Your hosts are Robert Forto and Kurosh Parto. Our producer is Robert Forto and created for First Paw Media.